Okay, let's bring on Steve with a round of applause. <laughs> Michigan and all other parts around the world. All right, Jared. Thanks a lot. All right. Good to see everybody. Let's see. Open up your scriptures to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God, that no one should take advantage of, take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we command you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Finally, then, brethren, we urge you and exhort you in the Lord that you should abound more and more. You know, when you, I read this, you know, it's, it's good instruction. Seems very practical, kind of matter of fact. We just ought to go do this stuff. Sure sounds simple. To do. You know, the first verse says it all. He says that we should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. How we ought to walk and please God. And we're talking about the great I am, the eternal self existing one who inhabits eternity the creator of the heaven and earth and sea and everything that's in it, that we ought to just walk and please him. Verses 3 through 8 tells us what we ought to put off. Don't be fornicating. You wouldn't think he'd have to tell us that, but obviously he thinks he does, that we should abstain from sexual immorality, that we ought to each know how to possess our own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. These who formerly were Gentiles. These are things we ought to put off. Verses 9 through 12 tell me what, what we ought to be putting on concerning the brotherly love. He said, I have no need to write to you. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Talks about us aspiring to lead quiet lives, minding our own business, to work with our own hands as we've been commanded. Put that on. Again, pretty straightforward. Yeah, let's just go do all that. How's it working for you so far? Who, who's writing this? Oh, the Apostle Paul. We know he's inspired because all the scriptures given by the inspiration of God, he even said himself, he wasn't taught this, neither did he learn it from any man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, these are the commandments from the Lord. You know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, from Jesus. 
Well, then who is he speaking to? Well, obviously the Thessalonians, but I don't mean that. He is not writing to mere mortals. I remember reading one time where C.S. Lewis had said that if you could see a, a human being for what they really are, he said you'd be tempted to fall down and worship some and flee from others. If you could see them for what they actually in reality are, humans. He said, you have never spoken to a mere mortal. He's saying something there. This apostle knows who he's writing to. These people have been born again. These people have been born again of water and spirit. They're considered, according to the scripture, no longer in the flesh, but actually in the spirit of the spirit of God be in them. And if they don't have the Spirit of Christ, they're not of His. This inspired apostle who himself is, not only, as I said, divinely inspired, but he's a spiritual being. And he knows it. He's trying to get them to know it, to understand it, and to walk worthy of that knowledge, that fact, that reality that that is in fact who and what they are. Like I say, it seems like just practical instruction that we ought to know how to walk and please God. You know, the raw material for the church comes from the world. The apostle, while Saul of Tarsus at the time in Acts chapter 26, blinded on the road to Damascus, was told by the blinding light, by the voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you persecuted. Get on your feet. Stand up. I have a mission for you. I'm going to send you to the nations, to the Gentiles. And I want you to open their eyes in order to turn them from the darkness to the light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and receive an inheritance for those who are sanctified by faith in him. I want you to go and open their eyes in order to turn them. This is how we're going to know how to possess our own vessels in sanctification and honor. Because before that, B.C., before Christ, and I don't mean just B.C. on the calendar, B.C. in your own life. You've been there, done that. We all have. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writing to the Christians, he said, He made you alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power there, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once walked, or we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in the trespasses, he's made us alive, together with Christ and by grace we have been saved and raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's who we were in the past. Dead. Separated. Now he says we are to walk and to please God. We have the commandments, he said, to do it. But now we got to have the will to do it, the faith to do it, and it's expected and we need to rise up and do it. You know, God is not just wanting to give us a bunch of rules and regulations. Granted, an army, a military has to have rules and regulations so people know how to march left, right, left, you know, and carry out the, the commands and the duties they're expected to do. They need to know how to appear. They know how to, need to know how to wear their uniforms properly. They need to look good. They need to have a military bearing. We need to have a Christian bearing. We ought to look the part. We ought to look good. In fact, we ought to look real good. Because you see, we're not mere mortals anymore. We got to see ourselves as he sees us, as, as we really are. 
knowing how to possess our own vessels in sanctification of honor. And we can do it too. Man, we are made for this. Amen. We were made for this. this. This is all by design. Now, many times people see themselves, I'm talking about Christians, they see themselves, like I said in the Old Testament, how the children of Israel saw themselves as grasshoppers before the giants and before the walled cities. The objective that they were supposed to move out and take. They saw themselves as grasshoppers, not only in the eyes of the giants, but in their own eyes. We've said before, you can't do too much spiritual war fighting if you see yourself as a grasshopper. <clears throat> Where do you get that picture from? It don't come from the scripture. That comes from our old nature, our old man. That's our problem. Now that's what has to be overcome. That's what has to be destroyed. That's what has to be killed. That's what taking the land is all about. Cleaning that out, purging that out. It's a battle that we have to do. He puts the sword in our own hand. And we are to go and put to death. Colossians 3 tells us. Therefore, verse 5, put to death your members which are on earth. And that ain't the members in the church. That's, that's members in your body. <laughs> Somebody seriously asked me that one time. Man, she read that. She goes, what's that talking about there? Put to death the members. She's thinking about, about the people in the church. I should have told her it was. Because, man, that, she needed it. That's our members in our bodies, the old man, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, on which you yourselves once walked and you lived in them. Now put this off, put this off. The anger, the wrath, of the malice, of blasphemy, the filthy language out your mouth, and don't be lying to one another since you have put off the old man with his deed, and you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him you know I don't know if there's anybody out there that really understands <clears throat> uh, like this formatting here I don't even know what to call it this literary way this is put together because it just seems funny to me he just got done he's running down this whole list talking about them being raised in, with Christ and seated at the, where Christ have their mindset on the things above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God Tell them because you've died and, you know, your life is hidden with Christ and God and all that good stuff. And then he starts going down. This is what they're supposed to put off. Starts running down this whole list of what they're supposed to put off. And then he goes on to say, beings you have since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Well, have they or haven't they? Have they or haven't they? But I like how it started out. It was like a question. If then you were raised with Christ. If, if, if. I guess maybe that's, we have to answer that question individually. Have we? I think Jim DeDerry said this morning, really? Do we really believe this stuff? It's easy to say. You know, we do have to examine ourselves whether we're in the faith or not. Don't we know our own selves, how the Christ Jesus be in us? Let's be reprobate? Who's going to answer that question? Well, we all need to ask ourselves that question. You know, I've said before many times, we do have to ask ourselves a question, am I living the life right now that I could have lived anyway without a Holy Spirit in me? You look, you don't need the Holy Spirit to come to camp, family camp. A lot of people go to family camps. Churches that don't have no Holy Spirit because they don't believe, you know, in a new birth. According to Scripture, how to do that in order to have a Holy Spirit. Don't need a Holy Spirit to sing out of song books. You don't, have a, don't need a Holy Spirit to walk a little old lady across the street. You don't need a Holy Spirit to work in a soup kitchen. What do we need a Holy Spirit to do? How to walk and to please God. Got to have a Holy Spirit for that. You know, when he said right there, he said he wanted them uh, to abound more and more. Abound more and more. You know, the first thing I know that would go into somebody's mind if they were doing something, if they were up to a task, and you encourage them to do more and more, you know what the first thing you would think is, i got to work harder. Not to a spiritual warfighter. 
that is not working harder. It is believing more. It's believing more. That's how you became a Christian, a spiritual warfighter in the first place, is through faith. And that's what we need to abound more and more in. You know, the circumcision that's done and putting off the old man is a circumcision done without hands. It's a circumcision done by Christ. We are his workmanship. He is the potter. We are the clay. It's not about us working harder. It's about us believing more by faith and going forward. And believing what the scripture says about who we are. And really believe in that, that we are not grasshoppers. And that we are, as Joshua and Caleb said, about taking that land. They were not just able. I think we can do it if we really try harder. No, we are well able to go up against seven nations greater and mightier than they were. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it always looks bigger than we are. It's supposed to. And the things that we suffer... Look, we are not talking about bad hair days. There's some serious trials going on out there. People really going through some tough times. And for some people, I mean, as far as the difficulties, the challenges, uh, maybe through illness or it might be, you know, where they live. You know, we can't just always think about the gospel as it applies to, you know, middle class America. In fact, middle class America is a very small part of the whole world. Most people live in extremely difficult situations in their, where they live. As far as they can see, they don't have any expectation of any easy life in the flesh down here. This gospel is for them too. Because this is for everyone. You know, I travel a lot to various parts of the world. And as much as things might look different on the outside with people's dress and their culture, you know, and the stuff of their language or weird food, other than that, you know what? You don't have to be very long with them in their house, their hut, or wherever they live, and you start to realize how, how similar we are. We're, we're just people. I've noticed a long time ago, reading scripture, you know what I mean? It ain't about culture, it's about people. And the instruction, this instruction, well, we said earlier, I mean, this is about the Thessalonians a couple thousand years ago. How much do you think you have in common with people in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago? And yet this is written and it applies. I mean, we can read this and see it's, it's very, you know, it's good instruction, practical instruction for Christians today in this century. Right here in America. And you know what? When I'm preaching in other countries, in fact, in the last couple, three weeks ago, I guess I was preaching in Belarus and I was preaching in London last week. I don't change the messages at all. Not at all. Well, the only thing I'd have to watch out for is some of my, they call, some people call them my Steve-isms, whatever the heck that is. And I found out that humor don't translate sometimes very well. <laughs> Man, that can flop. You know, when I get going, when I get talking about getting shot through the grease or something, man, you want an interpreter to stop cold. I don't know. They don't know how to translate shot through the grease. I don't even know what it means. It just sounds good. <laughs> this... You can give this information to anybody, and guess what? They get it. They really do get it. I don't change anything. There's no need to. Because this has not changed. This is the word of the Lord which will endure forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word they ain't never going to pass away. Jesus said, scripture cannot be broken. And it's for all people for all time. You know, back up there in that chapter, at the third chapter, because, you know, when you start the fourth chapter, it says, finally, then, because he's coming out of that third chapter. 
Verse 12 says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you, so that he may establish your heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We are to abound in love to one another and to all so that he may establish our hearts blameless in holiness. You know, we really need to pick up on the way the scriptures put things together. It does matter how we understand these things, because it matters what we believe. Because when you think about it, that Holy Spirit that God gives us only acts in faith, and the scripture tells us that faith comes by hearing, hear the, hearing the word of God. Now that means hearing it rightly divided, and that means hearing all the truth. You know, the newborn babes, I get that. They start out with the milk of the word, and they have to grow. Okay, that makes sense. And we don't want to stay babes. And for the most part, in a lot of churches of Christ, I mean, I know from where I'm from out east, Jim knows this too. I mean, they're, wet, they're stuck in, the, in baptism, man. They don't even realize the rest of Acts 2.38 says we're baptized for the mission of sins and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that barely even comes up sometimes. And when it does come up, they have no idea what the Holy Spirit is for. My first 12 years in Christ, all I ever heard about the Holy Spirit was I received it when I was immersed to bear witness with my spirit. I was a child of God, and it straightened out a few crooked prayers. You could put that in a, in a thimble. Other than that, the Holy Spirit, at least not one that mattered to be talking about. Yeah, here he says here, uh, back in my context in verse 8, that he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us this Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is the guarantee that we've been given that we're going to make it because that Holy Spirit is going to do that work. You know, that spirit of grace is how the Hebrew writer refers to him in, in Hebrews chapter 10. When you sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth, there remain no more sacrifice for sin, but except for fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation. That's what we can expect, just like they did in the Old Testament. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses with how much sore punishment. He said, do you suppose he be thought worthy who treads under his feet the Son of God and counts the blood of the covenant wherever he is a sanctified as an unholy thing and does despise to that spirit, big S on that spirit of grace. That divine influence on the inner man manifested in his life is what that Holy Spirit's for, so we don't be fornicating or doing all the other things that he lists, like in Galatians chapter 5, all the works of the flesh that are manifested, uh, the, the, the adultery and the fornication, the uncleanness, the lewdness, the idolatry, the sorcery, the hatred, the contentions, the jealousies, the outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. He said, you do this, you're not going to have. And he said, I've told you this before, and I'm telling you now, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that context in 1 Thessalonians 4, what we just looked at when he was talking about, we ought to know how to uh, uh, conduct ourselves, and, and each one of us need to know how to possess our own vessel. He does talk about the sex win morality, and we're not to be doing that, but we're not supposed to be doing all that other stuff either that is listed according to the works of the flesh. It's all got to go. All of it. You know what he's driving at here? He's really trying to help us get to where we need to be if we want quality of life. Quality of life. There's no quality of life in walking according to the flesh. Again, how many of us have been there and done that? How'd that work for us? It all needs to go. And this instruction here to these spiritual people, this is spiritual uh, nourishment, the word of God, milk and the meat, will get us there. Because I'll tell you what, this here will produce the faith that sees and believes and it might, that we might achieve through the power of God. How to walk and to please God. Really, a mortal man, it can't be done. Mortal man, Romans 8, you guys know this scripture. Romans 8, 8 9, kind of quoted a minute ago. How he can write to them now, because these are Christian people, these people have been born again. He goes, but those in the flesh cannot please God. That's just a fact. Can't be done. Cannot please God. 
But to the Christian, he said, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwell in you. And then goes on to say, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. That is a fact. You know, scripture can't be broken. This is truth. But you are not in the flesh. Man, that's so hard for us to wrap our heads around sometimes when we're sitting here all bundled up and, you know, squirming around. We're feeling all these things in our body. Our body is this big sensor that just takes in and perceives all these things around us. And it's hard for us to think of ourselves when the scripture says that we're not in the flesh, but actually in the spirit because the spirit of God dwells in us. If we're going to walk and please God, it's not going to be done by the flesh. Romans 8 and 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Then he goes into that passage we just read. This just can't be broken. This is truth. If we're going to walk and please God, it's going to be because we are led by the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit, and we are going to be strengthened by the Spirit of God in our inner man. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. We are not mere men, not to be mere men anymore. I know he accused them of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because he said Paul, the Apostle Paul, was trying to feed these people, these Christian people who had been baptized. I'm sure they've been baptized. But yet he said, brethren, I couldn't speak to spiritual people though. But as unto carnal, as babes in Christ, I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal, where there's envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal, but heaven is mere men. I think somebody's already kind of said it. You know, we did not lose our free will when we became Christians. In fact, we exercised our free will to become a Christian. Because I agree with Mark 100%. God didn't take that away. We don't want to lose that. We want to be able to choose. If God took that away, what would be the point of anything anymore? We're not robots. And neither was Jesus. You know, I'm not going to try to unpackage this here tonight. And I know sometimes I say this and I get these knitted brow looks, but I'll say it again anyway. I want you to know something. Jesus is the architect of this entire plan. He is the creator. He is the chief cook and bottle washer of this whole thing. He's the one that set the parameters for the test, for the testing of human beings to the praise of the glory of his father, the vindication of his father's name. And when he put this entire test to together, he took off his privileges. And I shouldn't have did that because Tim fixed that thing. This, it broke right before we got up here. And then Tim fixed it. Sorry, Tim. I think I'm still intact here, so I won't mess with my suit here. But I wanted to demonstrate how the Lord took off his, his privileges. He laid them aside, is what the scripture said, and then he came down here. He put on an Adam suit, and he came down here, and he had to, like, whoa, he had to get used to it for a minute here. But he thought, oh, I can do this, I can do this. And he would be the firstborn of many brothers. He would be the first person to subject himself to the testing. The testing was real. It was intense. And the point is, he could have failed. He was of free will. He was not made to do what he did. I mean, in the sense of forced to. And he was not some kind of a robot. He had free will. Even in the garden, when he prayed to his father, he said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He had a free will. He learned obedience through the things which he suffered. It was not an easy test. How is it, how, how, how is it working for us so far? 
I'll say something else. I'm not sure that everybody might grasp that or get that, but I am absolutely convinced that when we are born again of water and spirit, we are, according to the scripture, born from above. And that's exactly what Jesus said he was. He said he was born from above. God was his father, but when we are born again, we are born not by will of the blood or will of the flesh or by will of man, but we are born of God with the same potential that Jesus had when he was born in a manger in Bethlehem. That's why we start out as babes and we have to grow. And as we come to maturity... How easy is it for us to keep those commands? How is it easy is us for people of the flesh to be able to walk and to please God? You know it's a challenge. It's extremely difficult. And Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. That was his intention since the creation of the world. It's God's will for us that we would be holy and without blame. And those whom he foreknew, he predestined that they would be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn of many. Jesus said in John chapter 12, in big John chapter 12, that when they said, hey, the Gentiles want to have audience with you, he said, well, it's time then. It's time. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it remain alone. But if it die, it produce much grain. Now he who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Now, if anyone serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. And if anyone serve me, my father will be honored. Now, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it's for this purpose I came to this hour. Now, Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified and will glorify it again. And again, and again, and again. That's how I understand that scripture, that this grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, but now it's going to produce, it's going to produce after its own kind, according to the Genesis account. That law can't be broken either. Producing after its own kind. He, Jesus, the firstborn of many, just like him, with the same potential, People who can now walk and please God, who can possess their vessels and sanctification and honor, who should abound more and more in the spiritual sense. Ain't nothing fleshly about that. He doesn't want us to abound more and more in the flesh and something you're up to. Something you're involved in. He's talking about abounding more and more and walking and pleasing God. That can only be in the strengthening of our, you know, going like in developing our, our, our faith. You know, I mean, we hear, we see Jesus sometimes talk about people's faith. It's like, where have you, where's your faith? Have you no faith? Oh, ye of little faith. We see that faith. And some people, well, almost non-existent. Have you no faith? But yet to the Gentile woman that, that pleaded with him to cast the demon out of her daughter, he said it wasn't simple that the lost sheep of the house of Israel wouldn't be right to give the children's bread to the dogs. Truth, Lord, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Woman, great is your faith. Well, now we got great faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Paul said he tried to feed these people. The milk of the word weren't able to take it. He certainly couldn't give them the meat of the word. He's trying to produce the faith in them that the spirit of God would act to work in them so they could walk and to please God. They could maintain their vessels properly as they were supposed to be. And he said, hey, the love of God, you don't even have any need that I should write to you about that. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another. You know, that love thing was one of the things that was always very, very hard for me. I mean, I thought that, that love, <clears throat> I always heard it when I thought, the people that I first in the church, I'm talking about Church of Christ people, when they were talking about love, it meant we didn't have to do what God said to do. I mean, that's how it always came out. In loving people, you just ignored 
their rebellion, their sin. That, that was love. I said, yeah, but it says right here, if you love me, keep my commandments. Man, that guy hated that when I'd quote that. That just drive him nuts. Because love just neutralized everything. Just overlooked it all. That's not what love is all about. Man, love is about sacrificing. God demonstrated his love in the sacrifice of his own son. Love is a sacrifice. It's not a feeling. It's an act of our will. And if we're really going to love brethren, we're going to have to love them from the core. And God will teach us how to do that because God is love. And he has done that. And we'll see all the attributes of God in his love. His mercy, his kindness, his goodness, his long-suffering, his patience with us. God is not about trying to destroy us. He's trying to bless us. He's trying to get us to that new abundant life. And he's, I'm talking about abundant life here and now. You know, that's the whole point. When we go forth with the gospel into this, all this world, go into all the world and preach the good news to everybody. We're talking about doing this for their sakes and God's glory. That we want people empowered to rise and walk in the newness of life, to be able to overcome in the great darkness in this world. That's what it's supposed to be in us first. And it would be obvious to anyone else who knows us and who sees us. You know, I might have shared this out here, I can't remember, somewhere. But you know, when we were in Vietnam in April, uh, we were doing the Bible studies in the, you know, in the hotel room kind of thing. It's illegal to do that. And all of them hotel rooms are a trip, man. I mean, you put 30 people in a hotel room. <laughs> I know some of these guys have been in them hotel rooms. I mean, the windows didn't open. It was uh, probably 99 degrees outside. It was almost every bit of that in that hotel room. And I'll tell you what, these people, man, the underground church, these people, they just impress me. They sit there on that hard tile floor. Some were sitting on the beds. We'd sit in them hotel rooms all day long, 95 degrees, sweat running down. People jammed, stuffy. Them rooms ain't built to put 30 people in. And we'd sit there, they'd sit there all day long, man, taking notes. Every time the phone would ring, men would just about jump out of his skin, man, because he thought the desk was saying, they're coming up the steps. <clears throat> We're doing a study in the hotel room, and this one lady that I've known for some years, but only through the humanitarian aid effort, her name is Lynn. She never came to Bible studies, but she, she was a contact for the humanitarian aid. Well, lo and behold, this last trip we were there, Lynn walked in with a group of people that were coming in for the Bible study in this hotel room. And she sat on the edge of the bed staring at me. I've known Lynn for a long time. She is a nice lady, but she never been in a Bible study. And she sat there and she just listened and when we were done and we broke up, we were out in the parking lot area and Lynn came up to me and she said, you are an angel from God. Now remember, we're talking about communist Vietnam and she would be Buddhist culturally. But I said, remember, forget all that culture stuff. When you get right down to it with the word of God rightly divided to another human being who is really is not a mere mortal in the sense, we got to realize that people, if you could see what they really are. And she told me, she said, you are an angel come from God. Like she was almost asking this a question to herself. She said, your words were from God. And she started to like cry or tear right up and I looked at her and I quoted this to her. It's been read here since we've been here this evening. In the second, or First Thessalonians 2 and 13, Paul said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectually works in you who believe. Man, I'll tell you what, if you've ever had that happen to you where somebody actually gets that like that and it comes right out of their own mouth, man, I'll tell you what, 
That's, that's humbling. Gives you goosebumps. Because she was so sincere. You know, she, it was like, you know what an epiphany is? It's, it's that sudden realization of the meaning of a thing. And that's what she was saying. It dawned on her that she actually was hearing a message from God. It was awesome. Because, brother, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be from each and every one of us. It's not just supposed to be understood that that is who we are. We're messengers from God. We've been saved to save others. And we need to develop the faith in order to deliver the message and the character to present to the people as Christ to this generation, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We have this treasure in earth and vessels, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Even though we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body, the physical body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body. And our mortal body, the life of Jesus, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body to who? To the world. That is who we are. Man, we got to see ourselves that way. And when the words come out rightly divided with the right spirit, as Brother Mark, I appreciate what he was saying there, they need us. Yeah, I guess all these... Man, these things look like cannons, all these things pointing it. <laughs> I didn't really pay attention. I just reminded myself what Mark just said, that they were saying we all look pretty good on the video. <laughs> how do I look so far? <laughs> hey, how do you like this vest? You know, I was told that this vest looks pretty cool. You know what, with all my traveling overseas, see this vest has got all these pockets on it. I'll tell you what, I am turning into a regular Boy Scout with all those trips. I go prepared, man. I got these babies in there. Uh, generally, this could be toilet paper overseas, but when I'm sitting there with my wife, it's Kleenex. Uh, got my water bottle in here. I got handy, sandy, uh, handy wash or whatever you call it. Man, I'll tell you what, this, this, I'm prepared. But I want to be prepared to deliver the gospel. I want to have all the things that I need in all my pockets and everything that I possess to be able to do it in the flesh. To be able to present, actually literally, as 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, to be Christ to the people. And I believe as I shared talking about Lynn, that is exactly what she perceived. And that's exactly what she should have perceived. And that's what people need to perceive in each and every one of us. Because, look, if we're going around spending our time moaning and groaning, complaining about everything that everyone else is out there moaning and groaning and complaining about, why should anybody listen to us? You know, when I told my testimony before about when I was really struggling and I needed help, and, man, I was turning to God. The reason I didn't go to churches and look to churches for my help, my guidance, is because I was drinking with church people. What the heck do they know? I was with church people that cussed all the time. There was a girl at work, man. She had one of them, what do you call it, like a crucifix, a cross on the thing. And you should have heard the things come out of her mouth. Why would I think them people knew anything? You know what I thought? I ought to be wrapping it up here. You know what I, what I, what I thought? When I, when I was desperate for answers... You know what I thought I was going to do, what I needed to do. I, never, I didn't know it was in the Bible. In, back there in 1 Thessalonians 4. Well, first off here, I should read this, verse 10, where he says, Indeed, you do also toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, you, you increase more and more that you, increase more and more that you, Aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. 
I think Suka backed me up on this. You know what I wanted when I wanted to get out of that desperate situation of hardcore alcoholism? I said, I just want some peace. I just wanted some peace. I had kind of a vision in my mind that I was going to get out of that drinking, man. You know what I was going to do? I was going to go to church. I was going to become a church person. Because you know what I thought I would get? I would, have, I would lead a quiet life. I'd be minding my own business, keep my job, working with my hands. You know, I wouldn't be hanging around them crazy people I was hanging around with. I really thought that that is what Christianity was all about. But you know what? If I would have just went off and went to church, I would have never found that. You can't find that by going to church. You're going to find that by knowing God. You need to know God. You need to seek after God, feel after him, and find him, for he is not far from each and every one of us, because in him we live and move and have our being. But you need to search for God. You need to hunger and thirst for righteousness to be filled. You need to ask in order to receive. You need to seek in order to find. And you need to knock in order to get the doors open. You can't just passively go to church. I try not to do bad things. You know, the absence of doing bad things is not righteousness. You shouldn't do bad things. That's what's expected of you. But he who does righteousness is righteous. It's action, Jackson. It's what we do. And it's what we need to understand that we must do. If we're going to lead a quiet life, mind our own business, and, and have the kind of quality of life that God intends for us, it's going to be in the Spirit. It's not going to be about us increasing more and more, abounding more and more by trying harder not to do bad things. It's to become a spiritual individual, dead to the world and alive to God. This instruction seems so straightforward. Doesn't seem to have a lot of, you know, it's not really glitzy, not a lot of hellfire and damnation or nothing in it. But I'll tell you what, when you strive to walk in that newness of life, you're going to find that you have to go through a crucifixion process because your old man ain't going to let you walk in that life for long. And if you want to build yourself a shelter somewhere and try to hide from the world and just pull in and pull the window shades down, you can't escape that way either. We have to give up our lives to save our lives. We have to hate our lives in this world. God knows what he's doing, man. He's going to get us there. He knows how to do this. And we are made for it. We're well able to do this. And by doing it, we will be Christ to this generation. The people will see the light in our own lives. They will glorify our Father who is in heaven. God will get the glory and we will have the ultimate victory over this world to the praise of his glory and our eternal life. So thank you for your attention this evening.